Lynch joining us on the line now to discuss Heineken's rejection of SAB Miller's takeover bid and the implications of Scottish independence, of course, is Chris Gilmore, ex of Scotland, now of South Africa, currently investment analyst at APSA Investments. Sorry to throw that thing in about the Scots independence, uh, Chris, but maybe we can get that out the way first. Uh, I, I doubt, if, well, if you had a vote or if you do have a vote, would you go yes or no? I don't have a vote. It's only people who live there and who are on the electoral roll uh, who get it. So I don't get a vote. But if I did there, I'll tell you quite categorically, I would vote yes. And without a shadow of a doubt. Wow. That would be against all economic wisdom or perceived anyway. Well, not at all. I mean, if you look at what would happen, and, and you see, you've got to strip the emotion out of this. I mean, uh, none of this has got to do with anti-English sentiment at all. It's really to do with um, people being in, in control of their own affairs. And I think, you know, Brian Cox, the actor, put it very well on Amanpour on, on Friday evening, when, and he was saying, if you look at what happened with the floods in Somerset at the beginning of this year, those poor devils down there, I mean, they're even now still struggling from the after effects of it. Had they been able to have control over their own destiny, they could have, they could have sorted the situation out much, much quicker. The Westminster government dillied and dallied, and it was, it was an appalling situation. But on a bigger scale, if you look at Scotland, and it, if it had its own... Um, its own uh, oil revenues coming in. Oil is still a very, very big factor there. And when you divide it through by 5 million people, it makes a huge difference. Take Norway, across the, the North Sea. It's the second richest country in the world after Luxembourg on a per capita GDP basis. Um, its sovereign uh, wealth fund, if I'm not mistaken, Alec, and you know better than I do on subjects like this, I think it's worth between, what, 500 billion and, and a trillion US dollars. It's massively uh, wealthy. So it's all to do with having a small population, an entrepreneurially based population, and, and large mineral and other wealth. So, no, look, it's, it's, it's purely on the economics. It would be the 14th richest country in the world if, and, and under independence. It's really got very little to do with emotion and, and everything to do with um, finance and economics. Well, I'm sure David Cameron is very glad that you aren't in Scotland fighting with, for Mr. Salmon and co. But getting to the, 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 the other reason why we asked you to come through here, Chris, and I, I know you know SAB Miller better than probably any other analyst in the country. This bid for Heineken, it is a strange, from the outset, a strange uh, breaking news to come through over the weekend because the Heineken family is in control of the Heineken company. So if they were always going to want independence, why would SAB Miller try anyway? I suspect, Alec, and you make the point very well there, I mean, I, and I agree with you entirely, and um, I suspect it's a kind of last-ditch effort by SAB Miller to try and put off the possibility of being absorbed into Anheuser-Busch InBev. Um, as you rightly say, I mean, the Charlene de Carvalho Heineken, Ferry Heineken's daughter, uh, she and her husband, you know, they're, they, 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 they shy away from publicity, and they've got a very interesting structure in which they, they hold their, their controlling stake in Heineken. The only, it's a bit like the Pickwick pick and pay um, structure, the pyramid. Uh, they've, got, they've got, what, half of, of Heineken Holdings, which in turn owns, um, what, 25, uh, 25 or 50% of, of Heineken. So, you know, they can block pretty much anything. And um, they do love their independence. They're in incredibly wealthy people. She's worth at the last valuation, about 12 billion US dollars, so it's not like she needs the money. And in the bid that we hear the, the, the machinations that were made, if they would have ended up in an enlarged SAB Miller uh, Heineken operation with about 14% of the shares. Um, Altria would have about 24%, and the Santa Domingo family, the people that you previously owned Bavaria, would have had about 11%. So the question is, did they want to be um, the masters of a smaller company, um, you know, which is about half the size of SAB Miller, I guess, or did they want to have a 14% of the enlarged company? The, Charlene de Carvalho Heineken, she's never expressed any real desire to be a controlling force in the actual business, the operations as such. Yes, they're, they're, they want to be independent, but they're, they're not really that close to the operational side of things. But I think it's this independent side that, that, that really gnaws away at them. So I don't think um, SAB were ever really on a, on a winning ticket on this one. And that's why I say I think it was more of a kind of a desperate attempt to try and stave off um, absorption into AB InBev than, than anything else. And how, how uh, imminent is that? Well, it's not imminent. I've said it's, it's going to take a, a year or two. However, this may well catalyze AB InBev into action now. Um, because, you know, if 
by some quirk, they managed to persuade the minorities in Heineken that uh, be in, in their interest to go with this deal. Um, in terms of volume, uh, a combined Heineken SAB would be bigger than AB InBev, although not in profitability. AB InBev is an enormously profitable company, um, so it would still be some way off that. But what it would do, it would make it remarkably indigestible. So I think with that possibility in mind, it might just spur the ABN uh, InBev guys into action and say, listen, guys, we really need to get on with this one now, uh, sooner rather than later. And at this point in time where organic growth around the world is increasingly difficult to come by, uh, a merger and acquisition of this size, which would, uh, which would actually result in a company which would be bigger than Procter & Gamble. I mean, this would be one of, if not the largest consumer companies in the world, an AB InBev, SAB Miller um, agglomeration. Um, I think I think they might just go for it sooner rather than later now. So hence the increase in the SAB Miller share price today, a big jump, 4.5%. But uh, there's another thought that as they have been rejected by Heineken, doesn't this push SAB into the arms of Diageo? Yes, Diageo makes a bit more sense, I think. Um, look, that's a, it's a different thing altogether, Alec, in the sense that you're now looking at a drinks company rather than just a pure uh, beer play here. Um, SAB does have a bit of um, experience of that, you know, they, 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 they've got their, their passive stake in Distel. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it would be more difficult and yet at the same time probably easier to actually consummate such a thing. And of course, the big prize for them within Diageo would be Guinness, um, which is something that they would probably quite dearly like to get their hands on, particularly in, in, in West Africa. So yes, that would probably be, make more sense in the short term. But I don't know if um, that would make it big enough to, to, to make it indigestible for AB InBev. Fascinating insights there from Chris Gilmore, not just on SAB Miller, but uh, he's, a, he's a man who understands economics and very forcefully in favor of the yes vote in Scotland. That happens on Thursday. Many people around the world are watching to see if the Scots get their independence from the United Kingdom. Well, it could have some kind of knock-on effect in many other countries in the world, Spain, who knows, even parts of Africa.